Hey folks, Danny here. A little bit of housekeeping before uh, today's episode starts, episode 42 of the No Clip podcast. Uh, thanks so much to everyone who's been listening to these interviews for the past couple of months. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. It's allowed us to cover like way more games than we usually got to. Um, and given the fact that we're kind of stuck at home right now, uh, is especially, uh, I don't know, uh, enjoyable to, to connect with people. Uh, you know, I've been stuck at home. We've all been stuck inside on our own for qu- quite a while. And um, our work is usually about going out and seeing people and talking to them, and uh, this has been a, a really good way of like facilitating that. Uh, but we are working on loads of other documentaries, so I wanted to give a quick little update. Um, uh, if you follow us on Twitter or if you are a YouTube sub, we often put up little notes about this sort of stuff, but I also know that some of you listen to the podcast because we have a bunch of people who listen to this podcast um, on iTunes and Spotify and stuff. Uh, many of you folks may not actually check out some of our documentaries. So if you wanted to know, uh, we're working on a small feature on Alien Isolation. It's about 20 minutes long about so some of the difficulties of that game uh, came into during development and how the team at Creative Assembly kind of got past them. Um, I am currently working on a the Dishonored documentary, which will probably probably be a uh, November thing, uh, given the, the size of this project. And there's quite a lot of work with localization, with people talking French and stuff like that. Um, so I'm looking forward to getting that out. That's our sort of like big uh, doc, our next big one anyway. Um, we also talked to the folks at Flight Simulator recently. So we're going to have a fun video about how they generated the world for that game and, and worked on usability and, and uh, sort of, I don't know, built an entire planet for that game, which is pretty wild. Um, and then I also mentioned on one of the latest Patreon videos that we are uh, working with the folks at Crowbar Collective on a uh, really cool breakdown of their design philosophy when it came to uh, Zen in Black Mesa. Um, that's a really cool project that we're, we're working in collaboration with them on. So it's going to be um, a little bit deeper uh, in the details than a lot of the stuff we work on. Um, and if you're a Half-Life fan, it's going to be an absolute must because we do a lot of throwbacks to sort of uh, Steam or uh, Valve. Uh, design philosophies and the sort of how they incorporated them and evolved them into their own uh, thing. So yeah, that's a handful of the things coming uh, to uh, to NoClip over the, the coming months. Uh, thanks to everyone who uh, participated in NoClip Summer Jam, by the way, on the channel. Um, the lanyards are currently being sent out. If you're in America, you should have your lanyard already. If you're in Europe, um, they are coming. Uh, thanks to everyone who bought a digital ticket and helped us out. And thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon, patreon.com slash noclip. Um, you know, that's how we, we run this whole thing and that's how we're going to con- uh, continue to keep doing so. And one more note, because I just remembered because of funding, um, we also did put up a video earlier this week on the Museum of Art and Digital Entertainment, which is the Oakland Video Game Museum, which unfortunately closed down their premises uh, about a week or two ago, I guess it is now. Um, they put it all in storage uh, due to COVID-19. They obviously can't keep the doors open and they're not getting enough money through the door to, to uh, keep that space. So they, they put it all in storage. So we put a video up, which is us, uh, myself and Alex Handy, who founded the place. Uh, really nice chap um, doing a tour of uh, of the space and showing us some of the awesome stuff there, including my favorite thing, which is a huge steel battalion um like terminal, I guess, that you can like climb into and learn how to play that game. It's completely wild. Uh, so that's up as well. And we've also used it as a way for people to either send one-time donations to the crew over there, maybe join their Patreon. Um, uh, but mostly we, we sort of want to like, um, I don't know, get corporate sponsors on board for that crew. I think uh, video game publishers or, or studios should be on board um, considering the amount of uh, work that The Maid does to preserve video games. Um, both, you know, uh, not not least preserve video games, but also like provide really cool services to to uh, kids in underprivileged areas here in Oakland, you know, free classes for folks to try and get them into STEM. So um, they're good people. They do good work. And we wanted to give them a shout out and do some, you know, use our platform for to help them out. So uh, we're going to continue to follow that story. But anyway, we are on to my interview with Damian uh, from Crow Team. Uh, quick uh, apology to anyone watching this on YouTube. I literally had to wake up at four in the morning uh, to talk to him because they're based in Zagreb in Croatia. Um, we talk about the Talos Principle. We talk about Siri Sam. Uh, fantastic chat. Damian's been there since like the late 90s. So we went through all of Crow Team's history. I did forget to take the lens cap off my camera for about 10 minutes. So <laughs> I was very early in the morning. I was sitting here uh, in my, I think I was still in my pajamas underneath. I put a shirt on. I had my kid on the baby monitor. And uh, and it, yeah, I was after a while I realized, wait, where's my face? <laughs> so uh, uh, that's why my sleepy face turns up after ten minutes. Um, but yeah, we hope I hope you enjoy the interview. Uh, it was a lot of fun to talk to Damian about uh, the history of Crow Team. It's such a unique, interesting studio. 
they make two of the most different games ever, <laughs> uh, and they're both uh, they're both really good. And what was fun about, actually about Serious Sam Four was that Sam Four has had like a you know sort of tepid response from critics. It's done all right. Some people said it was a good throwback Serious Sam game. Some people are like, you know, it's 2010. These games feel super old. What is this? Um, but uh, on Steam, it's doing really well. Um, it's gotten loads of reviews. I think over 5,000 reviews, a user review. So it seems to be selling like hotcakes, and people seem to be really into it. So it was fun to talk to him about that, about like making this bizarre throwback game in 2020, um, you know, not being able to please everyone, uh, and also just the the history of the team. And also I got to find out who does the voice for the Kamikaze Monster guys in Serious Sam, so I was pretty happy. Anyway, enough Irish boy talking. Thanks for checking out the podcast, and enjoy my interview with Damia. Take care. Hey folks, Danny here. Welcome back to Noclip. Uh, delighted to be joined today by Damian Moravonats from Crow Team, one of my favorite developers on PC for a long, long time. And uh, we have a great excuse to talk with the release of Serious Sam 4. Uh, Damian, thank you so much for making the time. How did I do pronouncing your name? Uh, you did pretty well. And okay. my first question tonight is, uh, which was your favorite game from Crow Team? Oh my goodness! I love talking to you guys because uh, I find your catalog of of unique IPs to be hilarious. Because Serious Sam and the Talos Principle could not be more different to each other. <laughs> That's true. I can agree um, with that. Um, I don't know. I th I think the it's. I mean, Sam One. I think will always hold a special place in my heart. Uh, I think maybe Serious Sam Two because that was when I sort of was upgrading my PC and I could play it, um, the way it was meant to be played. Um, so, but I did like before First Encounter as well. And Serious Sam Four is giving me those Serious Sam vibes. You guys are nothing if not consistent with Serious Sam. So you're like a super fan. In the end, I, am I am I a super fan? I mean, it's that's five games over the course of when did you guys like early nineties? You guys, yeah, were yeah, we 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 we, uh, we have more games. So we started back in I can go back to nineteen ninety two, but let's say the 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 core of the team uh, was gathered at around nineteen ninety three, and by nineteen ninety four. Uh, Crow Team released uh, their first uh, major hit, which was a game called Football Glory. And it was on uh, Amiga personal computer. Oh my you know, it was very popular here in Croatia and as well in Europe. And that was basically the game that made Crow Team famous on the Amiga scene. That's amazing. Can I, can yeah. I, I have a strange Amiga uh, Croatia story. Um, I'm, I'm oh, all actually, ears. So there was two teams that I used to love playing with. I used to be really bad at, you know, Sensible Soccer? On the, yeah, on the that's the, yeah. the game that Football Glory wanted to put off the throne. And right. eventually yes. it did with some reviews and in some Amiga magazines, they uh, called this game the Sensible Soccer Killer. <laughs> but tell um, me the story about Croatian Amigas. There was, um, there was a couple of leagues that I used to play uh, in in sensible soccer because I was really bad and I was really young. So I used to always go to like um, uh, uh, teams in, in sort of the west of Europe or, or leagues where they were not very competitive and pick the best team. So I used to always play Skonto Riga in Latvia and then Dynamo Zagreb in Croatia. Oh. Because you could, you could always you could basically like always win the league and then have so much money coming in that you would then eventually have build this super team that would like win the European Cup every year. Um, it was like my way of, of cheating it. Yeah, uh, yeah I just like, wanted to ask. Sounds like a bit of a cheating, but then again... <laughs> you do what you, you do, right? Yeah, yeah. You, you need to do what you need to do. But this would have been... I mean, when was when did Croatia... Was it 1991, 1992, when Croatia became Croatia, as, as yeah. it is in the modern yeah, that day? Was, that was 1991, so it was... a. Uh, well, it's been a long time since that, you know, we had we had the aggression here on our country in those early days when the Crow team was actually formed and the war ended in 1995. Uh, and it's been roses and flowers ever since. <laughs> I'm kidding, you know, like with every, every uh, East European country, we have our ups and downs, you know, but it's getting better each and every year. 
and actually the state of uh, game development in Croatia is getting better. You know, for many years Croatim was basically the only game developer in Croatia. You know, which uh, which did something uh, worldwide related. You know, and we had some local teams, but uh, they couldn't. That they didn't have any breakthrough games, stuff like that. Mm. Uh, yeah, and that's all. Uh, I assume changed in 1994 with the football glory, you know. And what can I tell you more about Croatia? It's a beautiful country to live here. It's very much depending on the tourism, you know. Right, yeah. We have a lot of Irish people coming over here. We're actually, I think, Ireland and Croatia are very similar game country population wise, you know, and and the mentality stuff like that. Uh, you got you guys like bars as well then. Oh, we have so many bars, you, you, you can't <laughs> even imagine, you know, and we all drink beers, you know, it's, uh, it's basically the same. <laughs> <laughs> I hear my, yeah, my parents have been there on holidays a few times and, uh, yeah, it's uh, it sounds similar except much more Mediterranean and, uh, yeah, and, much more warmer, you know? Yeah. Uh, so we've uh, we've uh, a decent amount of history to cover, and you've been there for all of it, which is really cool. Um, I haven't. I actually joined in 1999. You know, but oh, oh, you've only I, been I there for 20 years. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I wasn't part of the Crow team until 1999, but for a long time there were only like seven guys there. You know, from '93 to 1999. So, and they all had to go. Uh, we we have a army obligation here. Actually, right. we, we we had it, you know. So when you turn eighteen, you have to go and serve one year of the army. So uh, those seven, they could never be always in the office at the same time, you know. Always somebody was studying in the university. Someone was going to the army, you know. One goes, two returns, stuff like that. So I think in nineteen ninety nine. I came as the eight, seventh guy because the eighth one was in the army and we had another two and there was 10 of us finally and we pulled off the first encounter, you know, right. only 10 people. And You're with kidding, our, wow. I'm not kidding, yeah. It was, it, and even the tech, the serious engine, it was all uh, built in-house, you know. So looking back at those period, at those times, it's it's actually incredible what we managed to do, you know, with first serious Sam. That's wild. I'm assuming then the the sort of global hit that it became was pretty unexpected. It it was, yeah, but actually it was and it wasn't. You know, b before we signed the publishing deal, uh, we released the tech test, what people call the first serious Sam demo on the internet, and we we released it for free. You know, we uploaded it to I think it was called the ZD Net. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Z Ziff Davis now. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think yeah. I think that was like the the largest uh, hub where you could download uh, stuff from other developers, from software, you know, to games. And we uploaded the free demo, and in in the uh, the summer of two thousand, it became the most downloaded demo of the summer. Wow, you know, and so. Uh, we we tried reaching out to the publishers earlier, but we we thought we had an excellent game. You know, it was a bit different than than the games of of uh, that time. So it was <laughs> colorful. It had bright open spaces. It has so many enemies. You know, we thought we have something unique, and we have sent uh, like uh, the complete early prototype build. Uh, printed on a beautiful CD, which was ex expensive at the time. And we even had this design document, like 100 pages in full color, which we paid with our own money, you know, printing and color in 1999. Not cheap, <laughs> not especially here in Croatia. All right. So we sent this to many addresses and we got like two answers. They were basically no and no thank you. And so we released this demo and thinking, how are all these people not seeing what we are seeing? You know, there is crazy addictive game. We love to play it and we think it's fun. Why, why, why does no one want to sign us? And after this summer event, after this demo becomes most downloaded demo of the summer, we start receiving, I won't lie if I say thousands of emails per week. You know, and there's only 10 of us and we want to answer each and every person who, who, who took their time, you know, to write to us to play the demo. We want, want to answer them. So I had a wrist pain, you know, for a month <laughs> from typing. 
And it was am amazing. Right after that, uh, we got approached back by the publishers. And in the end, we decided that the most fair offer we received was from the new publisher, which was, if you remember, called Gathering of Developers. Yes, I remember, yeah. Yeah, that, that's a, yeah, G.O.D. It's G.O.D. Games. It was actually a publisher consisting of several small development companies that weren't satisfied with the state of uh, relations between publishers and developers and the cut they are taking in the IP uh, management stuff like that. Yeah. So we we, we were approached by gathering of the developers. And this is where our friendship with uh, Harry and Mike from Devolver Digital started. So they were one of the founders of Gathering of Developers. So if you if you are asking with with whom we are publishing our games, it's always been Harry and Mike. You know, for the past twenty years, we've grown into a family. Yeah, we're, we're friends, and I can't imagine you know Crotim without Devolver and Devolver without Crotim. It, that, that's that's amazing. That's yeah, because I, I I've only just put two and two together now that you mentioned God Games as well, and I was yeah. so enthralled by this whole conversation that I forgot to take the fucking lens cap off my camera. So um, uh, now you can see my my tired ass <laughs> Irish eyes as we're talking at six a.m. Pacific yeah. time. Um, that's okay. <laughs> just just have another coffee. You know, my kids wake know, yeah. me up every every morning at six a.m. So. Get yeah. used to it. What can and I work say? At, yeah, it's the work from home lifestyle. Uh, speaking of, if you're watching the video version of our podcast, there's some amazing um, axes on the wall behind you. Some beautiful guitars. Um, you're the like. What's your official title at Crow Team? Because obviously you're responsible for all the composition and stuff. Are uh, no, no. But... I, I I made all serious Sam. That's all me. So, <laughs> oh, there are people that help. By <laughs> basically, I did all the games. So, joke aside, I'm actually a composer, a sound designer, a trailer designer, and sometimes I help as a CMO of the company, doing marketing and going to trade shows, meeting fans, showing off our games. And But basically, I sit here and I play guitar and I play games all the day. You know, this it's is not, how people bad. perceive game development still here in Croatia. Oh, you're making games, you're playing all day, it must be beautiful. And I say, <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, we are playing all day. And then when I come home, I play even more. So my life is a dream. <laughs> uh, let me ask you then about that shift from, you know, working on Serious Sam games for a bunch of time to um, the Talos Principle, which is such a wonderful game. And I think... I think really I, unexpected, perhaps unfairly, maybe uh, as a as a fan of the studio, um, mm -hmm. it was interesting to see. I remember seeing the early trailers for that and being taken aback by what exactly it was. Um, and then it was interesting because it came out kind of in the same window as The Witness, I remember. And there was this wonderful little period of time when I worked in the GameSpot office as well, mm -hmm. where everyone was playing those games and talking about those games and comparing them and getting people to go back mm -hmm. and forth. And um, what was that like for... Uh, the team to make that shift from from you know the the sort of rampant everything goes nonsense colorful um you know exploding kamikaze heads of serious sam to the more sort of thoughtful cerebral uh talus principle uh it was a needful change you know we needed to do that it's uh, when people think of Serious Sam you know I've been speaking to the fans a lot I've been reading support emails and there was actually, when we released Talos, we received a lot of questions in a win of how does a company that creates a brainless shooter can create something so smart as Talos Principle? Uh, and you know, it's, it's funny because people are thinking making a arcade paced shooter, it's simple, you know, but they're forgetting that we have some really talented people who create their own engine, who, who are fantastic programmers, artists, uh, music composers. <laughs> and we have some really, really good talents here, you know. So uh, the thing is, Serious Sam is the game we want to make it, but just because it's a simplistic arcade shooter, it doesn't mean that our company or people here are brainless, you know. So coming with something like Talos Principle, uh, it also proved us that we can make a game in a different genre, you know, that we can do something 
as you said, completely opposite, you know, from, from Serious Sam. And it was a needed change. We've, we've been working on Serious Sam games for, I, I don't know, it was 16 years, you know, in a row. It was like Serious Sam, and we did some remakes in 2009 when the uh, Steam platform uh, was open to public, you know. So, and what, uh, what happened there is that the Talos Principle sort of came out as a spin-off of Serious Sam. I, I'm... Did you did you know that, or do you want yeah. me to? Yeah, could you get into that? Because I remember reading about how because this would have been bef after before first encounter, right? This would have been after Serious Sam three. Yeah, that Serious Sam three was two thousand and eleven, and we went on prototyping uh, Serious Sam four, and we wanted to do a little bit things. We wanted to do things a little bit different, you know. Uh, usually, in 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 every game or first person shooter, there is a key that you find and then there is a lock that you unlock with this key or it's a key card you know it's all, always the same principle so we were thinking is there anything else we can do you know that that doesn't just require of grabbing somewhere key on one side of the level and then going to another and opening the door and that's how one of the basic the first basic mechanic for talos principle was invented which is called the jammer you know, we, there was an idea, let's have electromagnetic uh, barriers that can be jammed, you know, with this device. And hey, they can be jammed from both sides. And so we started playing and this was fun. But then our gameplay designer, Tom, I went and created a few more levels, you know, with, with different jammers. And suddenly this thing started becoming something entirely different so we thought okay let, maybe we can think of another mechanic there and so there was this game on an iphone where you have it's like a chess grid and you know there are some dots of different color usually in pairs and then you need to connect them but not to cross them you know you're just trying to to do the connection from one dot to the other in all different colors and that became the basics for our uh, connector, rod connector mechanics, you know, which became the second most important mechanic in Talos Principle. And suddenly we had something that wasn't looking, that, that played differently uh, from every other game we made. Mostly serious, Sam. <laughs> so it, it, was, it was fun. We created a few levels. We even had Lego bricks, you know, we bought Lego sets and we prototyped with Lego bricks, you know, there That's was amazing. like, like the, the wheel that was uh, the fan, you know, one of the mechanics that we used <laughs> later, you know, so it's the wheel, small wheel. And we had uh, like the mines uh, where R2-D2 from Star Wars set, stuff like that. I can't remember right now. But uh, we, we, we managed to, to create something out of pure luck, accident. And as I said, the first thing, needless accident, you know, to prove ourselves we can do something different. And in the end, this grew to be the Talos principle. We, we, we were thinking about, okay, how can we connect those puzzles with something meaningful? Mm. And our we usually have lunch, you know, in the offices, we sit down together and then we discuss a lot of things. We discuss movies, music, but we talk about uh, all stuff uh, that interests us from uh, history, ancient civilizations. We talked about metahumanisms, you know, will humans evolve into robots? There was this idea that we might make a uh, robot a star of the Talos Principle game. But since we are not known for delivering best stories, you know, we are Croats, we, we can't write in English that well. Uh, one of our guys told, uh, told us that he played an amazing indie game called The Swapper and that he liked the writing so much and that we should try and contact this guy to see if he's interested in writing something for our puzzle game, which we, we, we it had no name yet, you know, I think I can't try. it was Nexus. I think we called it Nexus, you know, it was just a early prototype name for the Talos Principle. And this guy was Tom Joubert, you know, he, he's a great writer. He did so many games uh, after Talos Principle, really famous ones. But he told us that he actually has a friend who is even more into all this transhumanism, you know, metaphysics and philosophy. He's, he's a, a Greek guy living in Germany. His name was Jonas Kiratsis. I mean, his name is still Jonas Kiratsis. You know, but, <laughs> and he can get in touch with him. So maybe they can do 
uh, a story where they divide the characters, you know, one will write uh, one character, the other one will write the second one, and there will be this clash of characters in this game, which in the end became Milton, the library assistant, if you play the game, and Elohim, the voice of God that guides you through these levels. And so and we thought it was an excellent idea, and they were like a match made in heaven, you know, mm. their writing was so good that in the end the game turned out to be something really amazing you know and it was a beautiful experience for everyone here at crow team and i think this is still the game that i'm most proud of you know beside mm -hmm. the first encounter but uh, it's a game that's that i can actually give my kids to play you know i can't give them serious time they're too young but talos principle go ahead solve some puzzles if you can <laughs> Yeah, you, you don't want your smarter than your dad. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want your children having nightmares about uh, uh, people with bombs on their hands screaming no, at them. No, no, no nobody wants that. Yeah, that's probably no, that although if you know there is a setting in Serious Sam where you can change all this gore and blood, we call it the hippie mode. You know that it's all flowers <laughs> and rainbows and crazy lollipops, and then it actually becomes a bit of a wacky game. They're they're just coming <laughs> to hug you. That's it. They're just, they're yeah, just, yeah, they're coming yeah. with flowers and heads. To yeah. You and they explode into flowers and it's it's fun um so like let's let's bring it to the modern day then serious sam 4 can you first of all tell me you know over the course of that time um how did the team size shift you obviously started with a with a very very small amount of people working on that first game um how has it grown how has the team grown over the past uh, 20 years so first encounter it was 10 of us and for the second encounter we brought two Two guys that we knew were into games pretty much, you know, they wanted to work in games and they were very eager. And they are both still here with us, you know. <laughs> the the core, team, core team is actually pretty solid and stable all these years. So, and then for the Series M2, we received, let's say, a proper budget, you know, so we expanded to... 20 something people you know and we all we we how do you say we lost lose all breaks you know there are no breaks right. let's just let's, let's make whatever we want you know we made the craziest game ever you know so colorful with wacky enemies and some over the top humor and that humor wasn't for everyone but we had fun you know making serious sam 2 there was like it was so much fun then we, for the Sirius M3, there was one project in the meantime, which caused us to downsize again. And for the Sirius M3, it was like, again, less than 15 people. Wow. And the Talos principle, I think it was 25 of us. And currently, I believe there's 40 something, right. 40, around, around 40. So we are not the smallest in the team, you know, like people, five to six people. We are not the big in the team, like 100 and plus. We're somewhere in between with 40 people and and, and that's it. I, I don't think we, we, we are looking to grow more, you know, it's most of the people have been here for the long time. They're experts at their field. You know, and we can always, if, if, if there's a need, we can do some outsourcing, you know, if we need some additional materials. But I think that 40 people works for Crow Team, you know, we can work like that. We're a bit like rock band. We're not <laughs> as organized as as when you have a lot of people. So you need to, sometimes you, in a big company, I have a friend working in a big company, uh, they don't know each other's names, you know, right. and it's, it's, it's different here, we know each and every person knows everyone else and we hang after work i mean it's still croatia small country so it's a bit of a family atmosphere here yeah actually. it's so. it's amazing it's such a we don't talk to many studios that are at that sort of level but you guys have it reminds me actually of some of the first person shooter studios we've been to in the past where you have a lot of institutional knowledge you have people who have been there for a long period of time who know the tech who know each other and who know you know a lot about making games so you don't need to sort of have that expansion contraction thing in between projects perhaps um yeah we had it but as said we find our optimal people point is probably around 40 and i think we'll keep it that way right um, so that's, yeah, it's, I'm even more excited to talk about Serious Sam 4 now, knowing that it was uh, produced by such a, a modest uh, team. So uh, what was the, 
uh, development like on Sam 4 then? Because um, playing it now as an end user, it fe- feels very, you know, on brand for Serious Sam in like, I think in a way that I think for a 2020 ga- game where you're either on board or you're not, it kind of is the, the vibe I get. Uh, looking at the, the critical reviews has been interesting because th- there is that sort of like split. And then when you look at the Steam reviews, um, people... I don't know. They seem to know what they're signing up for, and and it is kind of uh, that type of game. It's you know, get used to hitting the S button and and firing projectiles at people and and doing that whole like dance that you do with with uh, with, with the type of enemy that's in Serious Sound Four. So w- I guess when you started the project, was there any you know you went left field with with the start of the idea for it, which ended up being the Talos Principle, you know, back in 2014. And um, mm-hmm. when you started proper again on Sound Four, was it did you guys kind of know the game you wanted to make that it was like pretty close to before first first encounter so we 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 always try you know we don't think we call this the serious formula you know the 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 serious same game we think it has a certain formula which has not been changed for the past 20 years you know there's still arcadish gameplay style uh there are very familiar weapons you know we don't do any um esoteric weapons you know you always know you ha- you will have a pistol you will have a single shotgun double shotgun so there are a some cannonball roots. gun and cannonball of course <laughs> there are some roots you know that that are uh, associated with this serious same game but we always try to improve that formula by adding a little bit of the things that influenced us uh, when we played some other games you know as we, we are still gamers so I still come home and right after now, now I finally finished the Series M4. I'm looking forward to playing Last of Us 2. You know, it's been sitting on my PlayStation, <laughs> you know, waiting for me. Okay, now, now is the time. <laughs> so we are still gamers. We are playing all the other games. And of course, the first person shooters that, that we uh, loved playing the most, they're still important to us, you know, and we always play them and see if there's anything that we might uh we might be able to to do in our game that will bring us to the level of these modern shooters while still keeping the old school arcade vibe you know it's important for uh, you, you you just said it perfectly it's a serious m game so serious m4 undeniably is a serious m game that fits the franchise like the first thing first encounter 20 years ago so we, we need to keep it within the franchise you know we cannot change everything in this game uh, we need to keep some roots grounded and so for the for the series m4 i told you that the talus was devised out of the puzzle for series m4 but after we completed talus and we went back working on sam we tried those puzzles and they didn't fit. They changed the pacing of the game, you know. So suddenly I was shooting hundreds of kamikaze and then I entered the area. Oh, there is a jammer. Wait, I need to jam these doors. Okay, I need to jam it from the other side. It just completely ruined the pacing. So in the end, we decided to keep all the, all the Stalos stuff out, you know. Unless there is a secret inside Series <laughs> M4, which I can't talk about. But uh, all the stuff for the Talos... We say, okay, let's keep this for the Talos, and let's let's do what we what we know to do best. So let's make another great Series M4 game. And we also needed. Uh, it's been quite a while, you know, since the the the, the year gap between Talos and Series M. But in the meantime, we also released uh, Talos Principle on PlayStation 4 mm-hmm. and on iOS and on Android. Then we released the uh, exclusive VR game. You know, we, yeah. we are techno buffs. We have our own engine. So we are always interested in technology. And when the VR came, it was like, damn, damn. It was so amazing, you know. So we we decided, okay, guys, let's do something in VR. And it was beautiful. So we released The Last Hope. And then we converted all our portfolio games from Series M First Encounter to the Series M3 into VR games. So we released like five vr games in one year that's like the it must be some kind of a record you know <laughs> then we wanted to upgrade our engine we wanted to do make serious sam 4 biggest baddest uh, toughest game ever you know with the biggest landscape we can make the, the the biggest amount of enemies we just wanted to turn the amp from 10 to 11 
you know, on Sirius M4. So we had to build a tech to support it. And we built this uh, Legion system that allowed us to create believable battlefields, you know, and this was maybe miscommunicated among the fans, you know, they're th like, you will be fighting 100,000 enemies. You can't, you don't have 100,000 bullets, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's impossible. So, but uh, Legion System was there actually to create believable battlefields, you know, where, where you are fighting some, let's say, key enemies and there are two armies clashing, you know, like Lord of the Rings, Helms, Battle at Helms Deep. So, so that was the point of this system. And, uh, what we wanted to do big terrains you know so we upgraded our terrain engine and in the end this all took instead of months it took years you know mm -hmm. so here we are 2020 uh releasing a game that's crazy hectic but we uh, admittedly we had some tech problems on launch that we actually managed to fix very quickly and i don't know I, i'm i'm still receiving emails from people saying that this is the best game in the series. Mm. You know, they played all the games uh, before. They were huge Serious Sam fans. And this is like even better than Serious Sam 3 game. Like it, it even fits the series more than Serious Sam 3 back in the days was. So Yeah, it's interesting because I feel like Serious Sam 3 as well had a big... Um, it was like Serious Sam 2 was such an impressive like you can sense that the team getting bigger as well like the bigger budget in it and serious sam 3 had a big sort of shoes to fill in that respect and i often mm -hmm. wonder as well with the because it's been a while since three it was 2011 right so like it's almost been 10 years almost well, almost yeah it's so not it, like we've been sitting on our hands or what's the expression <laughs> you know we've been so busy over this nine ten years but yeah it's been it's been a long time since last serious sam it's, yeah, so it's funny because I was waiting for the game to come out and see which way it would break, right? Because you and and so many games like you know Duke Nukem is an easy comparison where a series that has drifted in different directions and often has lost a lot of its fans in doing so. Um, whereas it seems like uh, you guys, like I've been checking Reddit and reading a lot of Steam reviews, a um, lot of very pleased Serious Sam fans out there, and it looks like it's selling like hotcakes as well. Is it? Do you, are you guys, how are you guys feeling? Because I know you're, it's a strange time to interview you because it, the game has just been released. So you're probably, mm -hmm. you know, hot working on uh, fixes for it. But um, how has the team been? And have you guys got to like celebrate in any way, uh, given the fact that you're all remote now? Yeah, we are all remote. So we celebrate in smaller group, groups. <laughs> you know, we, <laughs> we, we mingle, we meet after work. But we, we didn't since there are 40 of us. And currently there is... Uh, like a government uh, declaration that you can have uh, family, okay, we are family, right. that you can have family <laughs> meetings up to 20 people. So that there's no way <laughs> you know, that 40 of us will gather anywhere here, you know, together. But uh, yeah, there we have like a programming department uh, for game code. We have programming department for the engine. We have artists, you know, we have uh, marketing team, we have level designers, so we all mingle on occasions. And yeah, we we've been using Discord. You know, this is this is what actually changed changed how how we work. We, we at first when when all this uh, COVID crisis started, we didn't know how it will impact our studio. You know, we mm. we are used to working from one central locations, and this is actually I I'm the only guy working here right now. You know, this is. And my studio is built here. Obviously, I cannot relocate home because right. I can't move the walls and the speakers and the equipment and everything I have I have here. But uh, the rest of the team actually managed to do pretty well working from home, you know. And and these daily chats on Discord, you know, where we are on the same group and you have your mic and you you can speak like you're in the same room. We we tell each other jokes and memes, you know. It, it kept us bonded. So right. Thank God for the modern modern technology <laughs> and for the communication software, you know, that I, I don't think this would be possible a few years ago if it happened. You know, so yeah. So uh, yeah, we are we are probably celebrating in our inner selves. All right. Hopefully one day you'll get to you know, one we'll, day we'll, soon. We'll get together, pretty sure. I'm pretty sure just let let's let's go through this crisis, you know, unscratched and then then we can celebrate. It's never too late to drink a few beers and grab a steak.
<laughs> exactly. <laughs> Any excuse. Um, like, can I ask you a little bit then about sort of the design, the sort of philosophies of of the of the series? Um, I know it's not necessarily your your particular um, expertise on the team, but you know, given your time at the studio, I think you probably can answer quite a lot of these things. Um, is there any? What do you think is like the sort of the 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 rule of a serious Sam game? Like the the types of enemies, the types of levels. Like what what do you think makes a serious Sam level, an encounter, a battle sort of work? What what, what, what how is it different from other FPS games? Uh, so our enemies, I can't say they are very smart. You know, we we are actually we are. <laughs> We proved with Talos principle we are not dumb and we are not brainless so that we can code some pretty complex stuff and mechanics you know but uh, and we we actually we tried creating an ai for the enemies that was a bit advanced and it didn't work you died right. within seconds you know they were too smart so the core gameplay of serious sam is we something we called dancing with the enemies so when i say dancing you strafe left three right you run backwards and the enemies are attacking you but their attack movement their patterns are pretty predictable mm. and this is where you can actually learn these patterns it's it's like uh what, what's what's the name uh ga galaxy or galaxians you know the old stuff from the 80s where right. you can learn the patterns and you shoot at the uh spaceships attacking you so this is this is the core of Sirius Sam is in its simplicity. You can learn the pattern of each and every enemy. They're pretty predictable. You know how they will behave. You know how much damage each weapon deals. You know that there is a pretty specific uh, knowledge between Sirius Sam players about how many double shotgun shots is needed to kill a verbal or how many uh, pistol shots for uh, I don't know clear or some of our famous monsters. So and that stuff that's stuff that we we don't change. So this is this familiarity uh that uh, gives players the ability to improve themselves and eventually finish the game on the most notorious of all difficulties which is not serious which is called mental difficulty where we <laughs> create enemies that are translucent for several seconds if you have finished the game on serious then you unlock the mental difficulty and the enemies are like transparent for a second and then they appear they are transparent and it's it's just for the for the people with most skills and reflexes so mm. we also try and keep our level design one of the one of the things we try to keep is bright open spaces so we we, we obviously played doom and quake back in the days and uh, there was this thing like with the first game, you know, Football Glory, what can we do to make it stand <coughs> uh, from sensible soccer, you know, to make it even better? That was the same notion with Serious Sam. What can we do to make it stand out of Doom, Quake, and thousand other clones coming out at the time? And we noticed that none of those games had bright, vibrant, open spaces and, you know, with sun burning down hot and we decided to go that way. So, and this is something that that is like a theme of each and every Serious Sam games. You know, we maybe have one level that is in some sewer that's like obligatory, but I, I don't think we pulled this <laughs> off in Serious Sam Four. There are no sewers finally here. So, so there is a in cutscene. Actually, we have like like a short part, but uh, most of the Serious Sam is happening outside during the sun, daylight, any weather condition you can imagine. And it's it's the, the also the big battles. They are like a staple trade trademark of the series, you know. Uh, crazy enemies like chargers, like kamikazes and verbals, you know. Then the shooting enemies like rocketeers. Then the charging and shooting like clear. So we have, let's say, a certain archety archetypes of enemies that that we that we do. And when we add new enemies. We try to fit them, you know, so so that we can, our gameplay designers who are already experienced, they can use these new enemies to, to balance out the game, uh, to, to keep something, to keep the game fresh and challenging. So, I don't know, I hope that answers. Yeah, what no, that's a serious same game, a serious <laughs> same game. <laughs> Nailed it, yeah, yeah. And we got to talk about some of the my favorite um, 
enemy types. Um, you mentioned the clear, of course, the harpy, the nar. Which uh, is your favorite enemy? Probably the I I think is it the what do you, I don't know what the I used to call them like fish monsters, but it's like biomechanoid or something is the name oh, for the what biomechanoid is the mech. The, the mech, mech. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I used to just refer to them as like fish monsters because they look like fish on top with legs on the bottom. The ones that fire uh, the. Uh, fish. I will have a chat with my modeling yeah, that, guys. That, that was just my. The I mean, fish that, was not what we were going for. That's 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 my <laughs> two thousand brain as well. That's like I just I've just kept them the same name in my brain this whole time. Okay. Um, probably. And what's the worst I, enemy? Well, which one do you hate the most? I'm interested to hear. This is as in, as in which which one do I dis? No, because I love them because I hate them because the kamikazes are hilarious because you need okay. to, like yeah, yeah, something. Think, which one scares you most? Um, <laughs> probably any of the like large the large bulls or something that I have to like dodge. Like what? Like the clear you can sort of take take out maybe before they get to you. Yeah. But like, what are the the large bulls? Like I know you you meet one in the early early Italian levels. In yeah, it's four. the bear bull. You know, it's one of right, my favorite yeah. enemies actually. So they scare me. Yeah, they're the ones that scare me. But okay, let's talk about the kamikazes, right? Because that that's maybe okay. one of the most iconic. You know, for people who don't who aren't putting two two together, these are the the gentlemen with bombs on their hands and no heads that are screaming. Um. I mean, you're working on audio team. Whose scream is that? So Where did you is, get that? It is uh, when I joined the Crow team, our CEO was doing sounds, <laughs> you know. So he pulled up a sound from a library and added his own scream, you know, that's him yelling. And so we've been trying to recreate that same sound for the past 20 years. And <laughs> I've done it finally for the Sirius M Ford. So this is awesome. a fresh, new old fresh old kamikaze sound you know newly recorded mixed in high fidelity finally after 20 years uh but uh yeah the mo the most monsters in the late late uh, late parts of the series is actually me yelling into the microphone i have some specific <laughs> software which i love to use you know that's used on uh mostly on movies for avengers and stuff like that uh so i use this to create my beautiful bassy voice into something much more sinister and threatening <laughs> <laughs> and um uh, one one thing actually I'd, i wanted to ask you about the the kamikazes yeah. as well is in four i i got the sense that there were more um, i don't know how what the terminology is for this but there were more like active uh, agents or whatever in in terms of voice work like when there was more kamikazes on screen i was i felt like i was hearing more of them coming from like very distinct angles um is, is there like a t especially with the size of the battles is there like a limit on the amount of uh kamikaze voices that are ever happening I mean, at any one time have, yeah we have we have certain limits uh within i mean uh, when i was designing sound in 99 and 2000 uh you know i was i was hired to do music but then they, oh, really? they asked who's doing the sound and they said ceo roman <laughs> And I said, okay, do you want me to do sound? And he said, yes, God, yes, please do sound. <laughs> so, and I didn't know how to make sound effects. So I read every possible article, borrowed every possible book, watched every uh, behind the scenes, you know, w which I could get my hands on, ju ju uh, on DVDs, you know, th those extras they had, like there was five minutes about making <laughs> the sounds for the Matrix and stuff like that. <laughs> so I watched every single damn behind the scenes uh, video that I could find, you know, just to learn, just to learn how they are doing, uh, doing this stuff. And uh, I remember reading about there are certain amount of sounds that human ear can dis uh, distinct at the same time. And this is like six. And it right. was by the designer from the movie Apocalypse Now, you know, where he was breaking down the scene where they're flying in a chopper. And when they remove the sound of the chopper, when they're, they're, the shot is from the inside, no one noticed, you know, because this was like the seventh sound in that scene. So I spoke with our uh, programmers and we decided to create a sort of a sound limiter system. You know, since right. all, all our tech is built inside, uh, our sound engine is also in-house built so i'm actually able to to ask for stuff and i get it you know and i asked for a bit of a better 3d positioning for this game so it's it's a bit you if you play Sirius m3 and play Sirius m4 you will hear that the sound positioning i prefer it in Sirius m4 4 
So yeah. we, we've improved it a bit so you can finally distinct uh, where is actually Kamikaze from coming from. And we have a bit better software mixer, finally. So in the end, I, I don't know, I've seen a lot of reviews, but uh, mostly people are saying that the sound is pretty okay. You know, and the music is fitting, so I think good job there. Thank you, Damien. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's been fun seeing the, uh, a lot of folks actually posting specifically about the music. You have a lot of fans out there um, who enjoy uh, uh, seeing what you're coming up with. Well, yeah, I, I didn't know about it. You know, there was a, back in the days, 2012, something like that, someone pointed me to YouTube and said, hey, guy, hey, man, your soundtracks are famous on YouTube. And I said, what? So I went on and do the forbidden thing, Googling myself. Oh, no. Oh no! <laughs> you know? Slippery slope, so, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so 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 there was really a lot of people. Uh, the, there were a lot of my soundtracks from various games uploaded there, and people seemed to love it, you know. And with every game, I always receive some sort of fan mails, and I actually often receive uh, inquiries about how I do certain stuff uh, mm. or can I can I do some advices, you know, and. I love teaching, so I try to help out uh, all these young aspiring composers and sound designers that get in touch with me. You know, I try to help them out with suggestions and I don't know, just helping out. We have a local uh, developers conference here in Croatia, which became world famous. It's called Reboot Develop. I don't know if you heard about it. I have. It's, it's, it's the one that Americans, wh anyone who's been there tells everyone else to go because, of course, it's in like Absolutely. the most beautiful place in the world. And, and yeah, it's. I'm, like, I'm glad it, to hear that you, that you know about it, you know, because it's really pretty well organized. The place is beautiful. And last year they actually expanded to Canada. So they oh, right. developed Red in Banff, Canada. But uh, okay, the point is that I've, I've, I'm doing the obligatory lecture every year there about mm. sound design or music design and try to help people out. You know, just I don't know, giving back. You know, that when when I was starting, I didn't know everything, and right. but I wasn't afraid to ask. And I, there are certain people who helped me. Uh, uh, yeah. No. You, I and mean, then back in the day, you had to look at you know DVD extras, whereas now hopefully <laughs> yes, people. Yes. Have... Now finally, you can go and ask someone. Thanks to this beautifully connected world, you know, I can mm. actually reach out to uh, to any composer or any sound designer. And say hi, I'm Damian. Uh, let's chat. You know, mm. if you have time, and they, and they can also reach out to me. So I think that's, that's beautiful excellent. thing. I have well, one more question before I let you go, and it's maybe one of the, sure. the most iconic things about uh, Sirius Sam. Uh, Sam himself, um, tell me a little bit about the process for doing voice work for this game. Is it uh, John J. Dick is the name that came up? Is that's that some? His, that's his real name. <laughs> that's, is that, is that honest, the question that honest to God. <laughs> honest to God. So, the, you know, when I'm saying my wife, I've been working with Dick. So she already knows what that means. <laughs> but John is one of the most awesome voice actors uh, I've ever met. You know, he's just and it actually when we released that demo, you know, that early demo summer of two thousand, uh, the Sirius Sam didn't have a voice, right? And so between all those fan mails, thousands of them. Uh, there were some guys that suggested, hey guys, you should you should have a voice like Duke Nukem, you know, some tough guy. And then one guy actually sent samples, you know. And I listened to those samples and, you know, the hair here, like, whoa, who is this? And he sounded so amazing. He was young at the time, you know, so his voice is a bit high-pitched. So, <laughs> But when I pitch-shifted his voice, it was like... Who is this guy? He needs to be serious, Sam. And turns out it was a uh, he was I think uh, uh, working in on a radio station at the time. Right. It was John J. Dick, and we came to agreement. And John was very professional. You know, he sent all his recordings, uh, and we loved working. I, I've been working with him for twenty years. You know, the, it's, it's a smooth ride. I love working with the guy. And over the years, I don't need to pitch him that low, you know. So <laughs> I think the first game, it was minus three or something. It was right. terribly low, you know. And for this last game, is one, minus one and a half. 
<laughs> semitone, you know, because he's getting older, his voice is naturally getting deeper and I don't know, in 20 years, I probably won't pitch it, shift him anymore. So that's amazing. That's I yeah. love it. I love it. Serious. Yeah, we're all getting older, but Serious Sam will always be the same. I like the. Yeah, yeah. We, 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 we you know, we are, we're really loyal. We, we will <laughs> keep John as long as he wants to work with us. And I hope he will continue to work with us. So. Excellent. Uh, Damian, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, an absolute pleasure talking to you. Uh, Serious Sam 4 is available now on PC. Uh, I believe coming to consoles, we're saying next year, is that right? Some, sometime next year? Uh, I honestly don't know at the moment. We are so, we are, uh, we released on PC and Stadia, you know, and we are currently focused on making the game the best experience on those two platforms. Uh, but if you look at our track record, Croteam is known for releasing games on all platforms, so anything might happen in the future. Just we won't be announcing anything. Cool. So, so watch oh. this. Watch this space. Uh, it's a bit of a political answer, but I, I, I joke, do joke feel aside, like I honestly I do music. You know, so <laughs> you will have to ask my other. Uh, no worries about these details so what watch this space let's say and then have you guys said anything public about another talus principle i i yeah yeah actually we are we, we mentioned that we'll be doing the talus principle too it's not awesome. a big secret and we are setting up things as we speak now so awesome it's I... it's, it's in motion Excellent. We look forward to more uh, beautiful games coming out of beautiful Croatia. Uh, Damian, thank, thank you, you so much. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. And uh, thanks to everyone for uh, listening to this week's podcast. Uh, we'll see you next time. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.